but yes, we have this thing called the U.S. Africa Command. And they come to conferences of academics to talk about Africa and to talk about um, freedom, to talk about democracy, to talk about saving African resources. What resources the U.S. Africa Command is saving for who? For the oil companies? And I think it is this intervention by the imperial forces, and let us call them imperial forces. And it's an imperial force that's in its death throes. We are not living in normal times. That is why we need to remember the Pan-Africanism of the 1930s. In the Pan-Africanism of the 1930s, Du Bois, Padmore, James was responding to the depression and fascism and racism. As we respond to the crisis of capitalism today, let us see how we have a new definition of Pan-Africanism. And that new definition of Pan-Africanism is coming from African women. Black women, Ola Taylor, Mishiri Muga, Ama Ata Aidu, Nawal Sadawi, they're developing a radical outlook about life that says health and life and integrity of the African woman must be at the forefront of Pan-Africanism. Michelle Mugo, in her essay on re-envisioning the Pan-Africanism, what is the role of gender, youth, and the masses? She said, though not cited in intellectual discourse that have so far come to be the literary canons on Pan-Africanism, in their activism, as well as participation, women were and have always been the heart of Pan-Africanism's essence. If you like substance, my point is that Pan-Africanism may be seen as manifesting itself in two major ways, which are equally important, though the movement itself and through it the lived experiences of African people. As a movement, Pan-Africanism has been characterized by fluctuations, registering the, the bouts of life and the rise and fall. On the other hand, the lived aspects, I want to underline that, the lived aspects, actual substance or essence have always remained alive and persistent over historical time. Ordinary people or the masses including the majority of African women, have been the key keepers of the carriers of the essence of Pan-Africanism. So this generation have a choice. And that's why you're being trained in Oxford. You have a choice. You're being trained in university to be keeper of the essence and the substance of Pan-Africanism or to betray the Pan-Africanism. Let us look at one area where we have to keep the substance of Pan-Africanism. Look at one of the areas. I wanted to identify four main areas of keeping the substance of Pan-Africanism. And these four areas were life that we dealt with with African people who were enslaved, health, peace, and the environment. I've already talked about the ideas of peace that is coming from the US Africa Command. Let us spend a moment and talk about health. Well, are Africans supposed to have health? During the time of enslavement, I want to recommend to you a book by Washington on medical apartheid. Medical apartheid were about the experimentation on black bodies. How do you know? How many of you know that the whole, the whole, the whole business of gynecology came about from experimentation on the bodies of black women during enslavement, when black women did not have um, anesthesia? So the Pan-African question of health today means that our societies and the states must take the health and livelihood of the people as the priority. When health 
cannot be separated from sanitation, the organization of society, clean water, clean environment, and we, especially in the 21st century, cannot separate health from the mental and spiritual health. What is happening to the African youth today, especially the youth in the diaspora, in terms of the incarceration of the youth, in terms of the propaganda and psychological warfare against our youth to turn them into zombies? How many of our young people are going to what they call second life? How many of you know about second life? What is second life? Go ahead, tell them what second life is. Yes? What is second life? Are you about the virtual world? Virtual world. Yes. Um, that is the virtual world where you do not have an existence in this world. That you're so alienated from your brothers and sisters that you have to live in this virtual world. When in the world before you, you have the chance of changing the world. Because they do not want our children to be involved in that change in the world. So the mental instability that is unleashed on our children leads them to depression. Leads them to isolating themselves from other human beings. And predispose them to the ideas of individualism, me-ism. And the ideas of rugged individualism that isolates them from concerns about social change in society. So the question of HIV AIDS that we, we, we must talk about. We must talk about how do you develop new Pan-African health institutions to organize, to deal with the fundamental health and well-being of our societies. I tell you the World Bank in the midst of the biggest pandemic in the history of the world can tell African governments that you must cut back on expenditure on health care. And we go and follow the World Bank directed forms of research about poverty reduction and poverty reduction exercise. Those who do World Bank work is really doing the work of reproducing the exploitation of the African peoples.